Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by NASDAQ. NASDAQ sent us this new survey of wealth managers, RIAs, brokerage houses, those kind of places, warehouses. Family asking, offices. Yeah, these kind of places. A couple of questions I thought were interesting based on where we are in the market. If you believed the stock market was headed for a prolonged bear market, what would your most likely advise clients to do? This was basically 50-50. That's one me. Group said, one group said trade defensively to avoid a downturn. The other one said hold firm and ride the bear market. I was surprised firm, it was maybe. that close. Okay. Well, what, what's, what's the split? Wait, hold, hold on. Wait, whoa, whoa. What's, what's... 50-50, basically. It's, it's probably 51-49, hold firm Hi. to trade defensively. I just got to ask you this. It, neither of these are, are easy, right? It's not easy to hold on in a bear market. But what's no. more what's more doable? Holding on for dear life or trading your way through it? What do you think is more realistic? Well, which one has more career risk, I guess, is what you're asking. Right? No, I, I'm not even talking about from the advisor's perspective. I'm just saying in just real talk. Well, my answer is always that Buy and hold is simpler. That might not mean it's easier. It's for most people trading defensively probably makes them feel better. When do they trade offensively? I don't know. Here's another one. When you want to trade defensively, which investment categories do you go with? The highest one here. So fixed rate bonds is the lowest answer. Variable rate bonds is on there. Hedged equity. So I'm guessing that's some sort that's of bear market fund. Market neutral. Or hedge funds. Yeah, market neutral kind of thing. That surprises me. This I, has I, to be a great year for market neutral. The last 12 months, last 12 to 24 months. Yeah, it is. All right, last one. Which would you consider to be a bigger risk to your business as an advisor? Not meeting the benchmark for which I set expectations. Not protecting my clients from major and prolonged market downturns. Which one do you think won without looking at it here? Which do I think, what do I think? Okay, no, so this is a tricky question. How would I answer or how do I think advisors would answer? This is, this is like the Keynes Beauty Contest. All right, ask, what's, I forget, I forget it. What, what, so the question is, okay, not, not tracking not the, benchmark? the benchmark? Yeah, not meeting the benchmark for which you use to set expectations or not protecting your clients from a major and prolonged downturn. Okay, I think most advisors, I'm going to say 60% of advisors would say number two, not protecting you in a downturn. Yeah, it's probably more like 70% of people said that. Protecting hmm. for it. But that one may be hard, but I would think that setting expectations, you put the downturns in the expectations. That's what I would think. But it's, it's interesting to look at this from a career risk perspective because there are probably are a lot of advisors who get fired during a bear market for either not setting the right expectations or not protecting because the sure. client didn't know. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize this was a thing. Anyway, right. interesting stuff. I mean, a lot of people, we talk a lot about retail, but the advisor side of things has way, way more money. Right mm. and and is more meaningful in moving assets probably. Uh, thanks to Nasdaq for checking for uh, sending this over. Go to Nasdaq.com to check out more of their research. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. We're gonna short start. <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> We're gonna start the show off with. Uh, I don't know if this By the is way, housekeeping. Awesome, fant fantastic scene in a long came Polly. Is that the first time that word was ever used? You, you just said no the word way. sharded. You said we're gonna shard. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I don't think I've, I'd ever heard that word before Along Came Polly. Very underrated movie. Is that the scene with uh, the ferret? No, it's the scene where it's uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and they're like an art exhibit. And he says, I sharded, dude. I got to get out of here. <laughs> Rest in peace. Love that guy. Sharded. Yeah. All right. We are looking, we, Ritholtz Wealth Management, is looking to add to our growing tax practice. Bill Artsaronian, who runs that, is looking for a junior tax planner to join him and Bill Sweet. So preferably, we're not namist, but it would help if we don't, have a, if we don't hire a third Bill. So if you are a, uh, somebody who is looking to do tax planning for individuals, give us a shout. So we have a whole running Google Doc of questions that come into all of our different shows, right? All the YouTube, the podcast, all this stuff. And we use them for Portfolio Rescues and for this show. And it's crazy how many deal with taxes. That, like, I, I know it's more exciting and sexy to talk about the markets and recessions and stuff. But like, regular normal people who are dealing with finances probably care more about taxes than any of that stuff, which is Correct. surprising. And, right? So Bill Artsaronian's background, he actually 
actually, 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 we got him from the Animal Spirits announcement that we were looking for a tax planner. We found Bill. He was a diamond in the rough. There's not like a million people that work at an RIA that also file taxes, right? So he was just a, an absolute gem. So we're looking to replicate him. Um, so yeah, reach out. All right. Also, shout out to Bill who ate a 40-piece chicken nugget from Chick-fil-A in nine minutes a couple weeks ago. It was a challenge in the office. And uh, so kudos to him for doing that. All right. Ramp Capital tweeted out last week. Okay. Looking back, what was the most obvious sign of the top? And I feel like the whole, pretty much the whole way up, we were everyone was making jokes. This is the top. This is the top. This is the top. I came up with a list. Here's my you initial list. Me. I was crying reading, the, uh, reading these. Do you remember okay. this? Do you remember uh, this video? Do you remember this video? For starters, this is not a sponsored video. We just... Do you remember this? Is this is this TikTok people? How do they make money trading? So basically, I just trade stocks on an app called Robinhood, which I left a link in our bio. If you want to check it out, it's free to download, free to sign up. They actually give you a free stock, so they're paying you to sign up. Wow. Uh, but again, not sponsored. And I know trading sounds intimidating. Yeah, the TikTok stuff was. I see a stock going up, and I buy it, and I just watch it until it stops going up, and then I sell it, and I do that over and over, and it pays for our whole lifestyle. Uh, if you're wondering how much you can make doing this. All right, God. All right, I got. Uh, well, the recent Matt Damon crypto commercial, Fortune favors the brave. That was that was an obvious sign at the top. Tom Brady laser eyes. Wait, hold, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Time out. What, any of these? None of these were obvious at the time. We 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 knew each and every one of these were more ridiculous than the last, right? Right. Yes. But it wasn't like okay, this is it because there was a million signs at the top, and we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah, it's more like a moving average. It's not like a a certain day. I think remember that Shiba Inu story about someone turned like eight thousand dollars into five point seven billion. Remember that one? <laughs> that was uh, a good. One. The, the you can say the February twenty twenty one blow off like meme stop meme stock nah. thing. Nah. That, that was that was like the beginning of it actually. Uh, Musk going going on SNL like pumping Dogecoin. That mm -hmm. had to be a sign of that. That was basically Dogecoin stop. Uh, all of the Buffett is over the hill stories. Remember, and then this was a good one for me. Th this was an early, early sign at the top. Remember Dave Portnoy pulling out letter Scrabble letters out of a bag and picking stocks based on the tickers that he pulled out of a Scrabble bag. I didn't think that think Dave Portnoy taking over the stock market was part of it. Didn't he see a deer outside his window and he bought deer, John Deere, the stock? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Arc. Remember the Arc commercial mocking index funds? Oh, that yeah. had to be a close to a top for them. Uh, Michael Badnick getting an NBA top shot. That was, that had to be, that was like the beginning of things. That actually, you uh, know, this one, that was February, 2021. That was literally the top of the market oh, or, are, or okay, top of is, uh, in, investor enthusiasm. As JC says, this is Chamath in January, 2021. When Bitcoin hits 100 K, I'm going to buy Goldman Sachs and rename it Chamath, Chamathman Sachs. That guy doesn't <laughs> quite tweet as much anymore, huh? <laughs> Not uh, like that. I think that's all. I think that's all I got. Okay, uh, we were uh, well. I have I have one for you and I. Let's throw some egg in our own face. Okay, bring it. What did I do? No, you and I. You and I. And I, oh, I stand by this. Okay. We're never paying off our mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a sign of the low for mortgage rates, basically. I mean, with all of these opportunities to earn a higher rate of return. Oh, oh, is that why we, I thought we said we're never paying it off because. Rates are so low. That was my idea. What were you yeah, doing? It's the same thing. No, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Okay. Rates That's are like so the, low. The, the it's meme free where the guy money. Goes, you guys are getting paid. Yeah, you're right. By the but way, we for were the also record, people to refinance. Well, forever. When when are we going to refinance again? Okay. Did you have this Exxon Mobil one as a as that that had to be? So that was in January. Oh yeah, yeah. As well. Oh yeah. Oh, Zoom yeah. was bigger than Exxon. So Exxon and Zoom crisscrossed. In October, was it October 2020? The funny thing is, we're going to get hundreds of examples from people and we're, of all the ones we missed. There's, there's so many that we missed. Oh, dozens thousands. Dozens but, the, but the thing is, listen, uh, when Mila Kunis rotated into stocks, was there ever a more obvious sign of the top? That was 2013. Yeah. Still the greatest CNBC headline of all time. Mila Kunis rotates into stocks, out of cash into stocks. <laughs> Easily. That was literally 2013. So just re relax. Um, oh, yeah. So anyway, so we spoke about this with Derek Thompson yesterday. Ben and I were on his podcast. Exxon is now 14 times the size Jeez. of Zoom. They were the same size less than a year ago. 
So maybe my my article, like time stamping the bottom, I said, is Exxon the next General Electric? And the answer is a resounding no. So I, I, I marked the bottom in energy stocks for sure. You know what you know you know what I did? I made money trading Exxon. Uh I actually did pretty well. I made like 20%, not to brag. I probably bought it around 30. I'm gonna guess I bought it around 35, and I probably sold it around 45, right? Something like that. I thought you were I thought you bought it for the dividend yield. I thought you were being paid to wait. I well, I was impatient. You know what the stock is right now? Ninety-two dollars. Oh, so you only missed a double. That's not bad. <laughs> it's not like there's, there's, it's not like there's a few stocks. I mean, in going, fairness going to me, right in now. fairness to me, I was definitely getting out of fifty, right? So, yeah. So Ben, how are you feeling about the market? Well, it's not crashing anymore, so it's it seems to stop. What if we Actually, get another we one did, of those night? We did our well, uh, listener mailbag questions yesterday, and somebody asked us, asked me. Michael, is this the higher low that you were looking for? No, it's not. This is a low, right? So you, so you think more pain we is to saw, come, judging we, by technical I'm analysis? Not, I'm not, I don't know. All I'm saying, for me, for, a, for growth stocks, if I, if I want to buy a growth stock, I'm not interested in buying off the bounce, right? We're, we saw a low. I want to see a higher low. We haven't seen that yet. We might, you know, we're going to. That's what I'm in. So obviously- unknowable. Let's say that 19% and change last week, that was the bottom. Let's say it was. I don't know if it is. It me- What's with not, that 19% number messing with us? We've had like three it, 19% declines. It happens a lot. 1990, it happened. 1998, 2011, 2018, like 19% yeah. and change. Just, yeah. But let's say that, let, let's for argument's sake, say that was the bottom. And we're, we go back up. Does that mean, did people overreact if that was a bear market for, I don't know, reason? Or is this just no the way reason? Work now? No reason. Well, Why do you keep no saying reason. no reason? You know, I'm saying okay. I'm saying is the overreaction that people people are saying okay, this is a 30, 40 percent crash coming. There seems to be a growing chorus of people who think this really is the next big one. I've heard a lot of people, you know, smart people trying to say like, okay, the last everyone buy the dip is over, and then this is this is it. This is a reset one. Um, I don't, I don't know that 30% would be an overreaction because all that would do is take us back to the pre pandemic highs. So true. And that, that's the, that's the crazy thing we mentioned it with Derek yesterday, the stock market is still up from pre pandemic levels. So take away all the bad stuff that's happened in the meantime, the pandemic inflation, we've had a two, this is the second bear market in two years and the stock market is still up from the end of 2019. That's pretty so impressive. I, I am more or less, I can't, no, this is, I cannot say, I was about to say I am more or less firmly in the camp. That's too wishy-washy. I will say that I am in the camp. I think that, I think that the market environment that we were in is over. And to be very clear, I'm not saying that we're never going to see new highs again. I absolutely think we're going, I mean, obviously we're going to, you know, whether that's in two years or four years or five years, you know, we'll see. But just this idea that the Fed having our back, I don't think that can be overstated how important that was. And you could just say it's psychology, fine. But that that's what matters. So uh But they're going but here's the thing that, though. Yeah, high ahead. yield spreads are high yield spreads are gonna blow out eventually if if they keep down this path. Something's gonna blow out, something's gonna break, we're gonna have like three hedge funds go under, and the Fed is gonna have her back again. They just are. I'm sorry. You're gonna have one down inflation print and the Fed's gonna have her back again. You watch. I'm not saying that the Fed will never cut again, but we're still only at 75 basis points. They have to get to two and a half percent somehow. But why? The market is already up there. I'm saying maybe they will. And they keep saying that they're going to do 50 basis points for the next few meetings. And maybe maybe they will. But the market has already done a lot of the heavy lifting for them. I'm well, saying, that's, like, a, that's, if, that's if, a very fair point. So the, the political pressure, and I know they're like apolitical, whatever, okay. The pressure to cool off demand, if inflation is still hot, is going to be massive. Now, to your point, the market already the market might cool off demand on its own. Retail sales just right. came in, by the way. Not a bad number. Okay, people are still spending money. I mean, maybe anyway. That, all right. So, so, well, this is arguing with myself, but maybe you're right that if if people keep spending money and, and saying whatever, I don't care. Inflation is hot, but I want to spend money because I didn't for eighteen months or however long people held back for. 
then maybe it won't matter. And the Fed will it'll force the market will force the Fed's hand, and you have to keep raising. A volume spike. This is from Ed Clissold from uh, Ned Davis. He said a volume. Uh, what, are, what are we looking at? Uh, damn it! I put I. I got no context here. Hang on. Bear with me. I apologize. This bad podcasting. He did a tweet thread on like waterfall declines. Where are we today? So basically, we saw more or less just a str- stocks just li- being liquidated, right? There was very little bounce on the way down. Um, so he defines a waterfall. So the average waterfall, here we go. The average waterfall lasts 40 calendar days, okay? Recently, it was 44 days. So on the magnitude wise, it wasn't that bad, but in terms of the length, it was, it was pretty there, but, but, but we're not, we didn't get a volume spike. And this is what people are saying. Like they're looking for capitulation. You don't always, you know, it's not, doesn't always follow the textbook rules, but he's saying on average, the 10 day New York stock exchange volume jumps 111% from the pre waterfall low to the high. This time it's on, this time it's up uh, 32%. So we haven't seen like the absolute pukage that people are, are looking for. And you might not get it. And that's the thing. Every correction is different. You don't have to get that. So like right. Gavin Baker did this thread saying he's super bullish on mega cap tech here. Great inflation hedges, broadly growing revenue and gross profit margins over 10% with high ROICs. Generally trading an all-time low EV to free cash flow, PE multiples, and almost all aggressively buying back stock. All time is a long time. This isn't 08 or 2000. I tend to agree with them there that like everyone trying to make this 08 or 2000, I, th- I still think that's a stretch. The, the way that oh, I agree, every, I agree. The, the euphoria in the nineties, it got bad this time, but not that bad. And the consumer was just in awful, awful shape starting in like 2006. Back well, to the 08 crash. I think the reason why you can't get too bearish is first of all, stocks just got killed, right? To get bearish now, it would be the, just the height of foolishness. Even though but that's what are, happens to a lot of people lower. is totally a lot totally. of people after totally but his, so, his point here buying Amazon down 40%. I don't know. Be fine. It makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Think, no, I, 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 don't, I don't know enough to like say Amazon's a fat pitch, but I think if you buy Amazon here, you're going to be fine. Um, the consumer balance sheet, we keep saying this, but it's true. The consumer balance sheet has never been better prepared to weather a storm. Sam Rowe is tweeting charts about uh, corporate cash that they have. Uh, we're going to get valuation support eventually. But I guess that's the thing is like, where should stocks be trading given where we are right now? Should they, should they, right? Because right now they're like 17 times. Yeah. I've, I've looked at this. The average PE ratio. And that, and that when, seems, that seems, that seems high if inflation persists. That seems on the high end. That's the whole thing. But I, I guess this is the, the problem. Like the, the 70s thing, the, the Fed didn't all the start, all of a sudden start fighting inflation in 1974 when inflation started taking off, right? The Fed waited until, late 1970s, early 1980s to do it. This time around, they're, they're already fighting it now. So fighting? The, it's 75 basis points. But, but you don't think the Fed's jawboning has, has raised mortgage rates over 2% and raised the, all the bond yields have come up? I think that's, that's, that is the Fed fighting. Okay. The fact that the market Fair. is believing them, the, the, the Fed wasn't doing this in the 1970s. They were, they were easing in the early 70s because there was that huge bear marketing crash in 73, 74. All the... All of the back and forth right now that we're having in this dialogue is just proof that whatever happens a year from now, let's hold ourselves accountable. <laughs> Neither well, of us do. Right? If inflation the, way, is, the range of if, outcomes is very wide. Yes, if, if inflation a year from now is 3%, everyone will go, oh, of course it was transitory. <laughs> and of course the Fed brought it down. And if it's still 6 or 7%, people are going to go, of course the Fed couldn't do anything because commodities and supply chains. So and I actually, it, it is I actually wrote obvious. about this. One of our like tenets, like one of our main beliefs, I think I speak for both of us, is that most of the time, even if you're given all of the economic data ahead of time, it's, it's, it's no sure thing that you can predict what the stock market does, right? right? I feel like right now, give me inflation and unemployment in December, January, and I, could, and I, and I feel like that's more or less all we need to know. Do you agree or do you disagree? Yeah, I, I think an inflation will be the one. If I think if if the next if this, if, two, if inflation is four percent in December, three or four percent in December, stocks are way higher than they are today. I, I think probably right. Well, well, unless unless, unless they it throws us into a nasty lower. recession. Yeah, <laughs> that's the 
But does it throw us into recession, but people don't care because they're looking past, so stock's bottom before then? That's, that, this is like why investing is so, so hard. And anyone who thinks that they can predict what's going to happen in the short term is, is either lying or delusional in my, in my eyes. Like, it's so difficult to do. Investing is all about that scene from, from uh, The Princess Bride. Oh. Right, with you, the poison? You love, yeah, that's a favorite of yours. Come on, that is, that is the best. Yeah, my kid, I got my kids into that one. There, there are a handful of movies that like you want your kids to really like. If they don't like this, I'm gonna have to disown them. Princess well, Bride. Well, did you my, did you did you did you listen to uh, ET Rewatchables? Not yet, but it's kind of funny. We played a little family game last night. Uh, my kids like to play like a favorites game. What's your favorite this? And everyone goes around and you hold a ball and everyone says what there is. And we watched it. And my son George, who just turned five last week, said his favorite movie of all time is ET. And I was like, okay, my work here is done. My Wait, work he's as a seen ET. Oh yeah, of course. We've watched ET last year. Okay, it's, I I gotta do it. I, I I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna cry. Let him get a little like, older. Okay. My and that my, movie my is, kids that movie is pure, absolutely that movie is like my, pure nostalgia. My kids loved it. Yeah, it was, and and he out of nowhere we haven't watched it in a few months, and he said, "Yeah, my favorite movie is ET." He he loves wow, it. So what a stud. Uh, all right, this all is right, pretty good. Uh, so Jason Gebhardt. We I feel like we haven't mentioned Seth Trader in a while. He tweeted. By the way, we're in a huge bear market for Michael mentioning mentioning Packy McCormick because yeah. uh, text down so bad. Oh, right, <laughs> sorry, Packy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, still Packy. a loyal reader. <laughs> I read his alchemy post this week. Um, man, what does that say about me? Sorry, Packy. I still love you. Uh, all right, Jason Gepford. During panics, correlations go to one. Not there yet, but climbing quickly among tech stops. There have been 493 days in the past 23 years when correlations were as high as they are now. Six months later, tech stocks were higher 491 times. Not bad. Or not good. Bottom? Good. <laughs> that, that's uh, the other right. also psychological for, yeah. trick you're playing is, is literally everyone knows what the risks are now. There, there's, I mean, unless there's an unforeseen shock that like comes out of nowhere again, and the, the war was certainly one of those, but unless something comes out of left field, the, the risks are plain to see for everyone right now. That's like the reverse psychology you have to play with yourself to think, well, if everyone th- is too far on this side, then things, yeah. Is that a, is yeah, that a every, coiled every, spring or is that a rubber band? Yeah, but, but everyone is bearish, but they're not bearish enough. I can't tell if we're in first level thinking or second level thinking or third level thinking. Uh, all right. Also from Sentiment Trader. Just, it, it's so freaking hard to think past this. To Like, like uh, uh, what do people say? Avoid the noise? Ignore the noise? Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. There's no reason to look at your 401k. That is true. There's literally no reason. But ignore the noise is a joke. It's impossible. So he tweeted, editors field stories they think readers want to read. And what do they want to read about? Bear markets. By the way, guilty. We've written plenty about bear markets over the past couple of weeks. Uh, sorry about that. Last week, there were over 8,200 articles But not trying to scare about people. True. The second most of any week in a decade. That's a pretty cool reading there. Okay. All right. I, I hate to keep quoting myself, but I, I came across this one. I was searching for something on my <laughs> well, blog. Well, we're at that part of the cycle. We're at that, that part of the I, cycle. Okay. But it's just funny to look back. So the, I wrote this March 5th, 2021. And I said, could inflation give us a wonderful buying opportunity? At the time, the inflation rate was 1.7% on the latest reading. So and, and break-evens were coming up still very low. And I, I equated it to the post-World War II, and I talk about this on Derek's podcast with Plain English, but I wanted to put a little more meat on the bone here. So look at this inflation chart from 1945 to 1959. Huge spike up after the war to 19%. Then it came crashing down. Of course, there was a minor recession. Another spike up in the early 50s came crashing down another recession. Another little spike up come crashing down, and by the end of the decade, it was low again. The 1950s for the S&P 500 are the greatest stock market in history from a return perspective, right? The best, it's the best returns ever. There was, there were recessions in 48, 49, 53, 54, and 57, 58. From 1945 to 1959, the U.S. stock market returned 17% per year. There was three recessions. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 corrections in that time. The worst was only like 27%, but there's still corrections. My point being, like we can have inflationary spikes and then minor recessions and inflationary spikes and minor recessions, and they don't have to be the end of the world. We can have corrections. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. I think some people just want that to happen, but it doesn't have to be that way. 
like I, and I think recessions are this necessary evil in some ways that sometimes if if risk is taken too far, you need a slap on the wrist to bring people back in line. And I think that's what a lot of investors have gotten. And maybe if we get a minor recession, that will just better align people to say, oh, okay, it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't have been as easy as it was. Is yeah, that is that I would be, too much? No, I don't think so. I would be uh I would be uh mildly surprised if we get like a big one. Right? Like I don't I don't know what would have to happen for this to turn into a 50% market crash. I think things would have to get so bad. I don't even know what that would look like, but that's not that's definitely not where my head is at. The Fed would have to get to like 8% or something. I think that that might do it. But then okay, that would being that that, that would be truly um I hate to use the word shocking, but um yeah, but I would. that would be shocking. That that really would be shocking. Um, all right, let's move on from that uh, horror show of a possibility. Bond mutual funds, still another $20 billion in outflows last week, the 12th straight week of bleeding year to date. This is, th- I'm pretty sure this is unprecedented. It does make sense when you think about it. We, we thought early in the year, if rates go higher, there's going to be a ceiling on them because people will flood in. But all the money had already flooded in, I think, is the problem. Right? So the people leaving now, it's... Last in, first out, I guess. People who well, were chasing the Well, I was a hundred, a thousand percent wrong on this. I was totally wrong on this. But I you think too. people that were flooding in were? You think people that were flooding in were chasing price? I think there were some definite momentum traders where, especially. I just thought it was demographics. At, well, a lot of it. I think a lot of it was, but a lot of it was those bonds were up so much heading into March 2020 because rates just fell off. You had that. That was a waterfall in the other directions with rates, and you had these amazing returns for like right. TLT. Right. It was up thirty or forty percent in a year. What do you say to people that are selling bonds right now? Where are you going with that money? I think a lot of people are. I, I've been getting a lot of questions from people saying, I want to move in my 401k to a stable value fund or into cash or something like this. I think that's the, the point, though, that I would not try to get too greedy and say, I'm going to wait until rates hit 5% and then I'm going to reinvest because those rates may not happen. And I, I do think... You have to think in terms of, we've talked about this before, the correlation between starting yield for high-quality bonds and returns over 5, 10, 15 years is like 0.95. So whatever yield you start with, so today you're, you're getting close to 3%. Your return over the long term in bonds today is going to be about 3% per year. That's not amazing. It's not really juicy, but it's, it's not bad either. And you could continue to see some pain in the meantime if rates go up more. But I, I still think that's a pretty decent proposition for investors right now. All right, Ben, you wrote a good post, Bear Market Survival Guide. You do. You listed five bullet points. You try to be healthy. Um, you told me you're, you're, you don't eat after 3 o'clock. How is that even possible? Hey, th- those are private conversations. I just want to say, <laughs> it, no, <laughs> it is impossible to talk about diet or exercise without sounding like a complete D-bag because either you well, sound like you're bragging – Okay, but I'm I'm saying you you, you either sound sh- like you're like, bragging, to sh- yeah, just to be like this is how I did this. You sound like you're bragging, or you sound like you're saying something that's unrealistic to most people. So that's why I just like try not to have those conversations. But yes, I uh, inter- intermittent fasting in my late 30s is how I have stayed healthy. I think. What else did Joe Rogan teach you? <laughs> See. Okay, <laughs> so you're healthy. You eat right. You exercise. You sleep. You turn off your brain for a while. What does that mean? Like at night, I watch TV or movies or read a fiction book. I'm, I'm trying not to just pay attention all the time to the markets. Even though you and I pay, do pay attention to stuff a lot and we're reading and constantly looking at stuff, uh, I try to watch the NBA playoffs or I try to do something that I watch TV with my wife for a couple hours a night and just try to completely like, tune everything else out and not even pay attention to the market. I think, that, I think that's healthy. You said... You said you live your life. I think having young kids is is amazing for this. Like on yes, the weekends, there's, there's very little time. For, like I was at T ball the other day, and nobody gives a shit about the stock market. No, I, I on Saturday mornings we have three soccer games, and we're from eight a.m. until one p.m. Basically, we're doing soccer games, and we're running around from field to field. And you don't, yeah, you don't. Have, it's kind of nice to not have time to think about that stuff. I think uh, the other one that avoid I, taking the market personally. How do you do that when you're down eighty percent of Shopify? I think that's the biggest one, though. People think that the market is out to get them. So, like, right when I put my money in, the mm. market's going to fall, or right when I buy the stock, just it's my fall. luck. Like, yes, like, right? like people it's, say, it's just, just my luck. It's, 
Yes, like it's just you. And that's the thing I think, the market doesn't care about you. That's something that's hard for people to wrap their brains around. Like the, what, what's the Adam Goodman one? The stock doesn't know oh, that you own it. Oh, the stock doesn't know you own it. God, that book yeah. is so good. Uh, the Money Game, one of the best books ever. Right, very good. And lastly, Ben, you avoid the dream of perfection. What does that mean? I, I think when you go through these kinds of things, people think that like I'm going to nail the bottom or I'm going to put on the perfect hedge right at the perfect moment. And I think trying to think like a hedge fund manager in that way, that's not your job for 99% of us to try to get things exactly right. And I think you can just, I, I think perfect is often the enemy of good for investors and just getting, I think good enough is fine for most people and not trying to like, I'm going to wait and I'm going to put on a, I'm going to get the fat pitch and I'm going to put it at the very bottom and I think thinking that way is just letting is just what's the what was the number in the the Jim Simons book? They were right fifty one percent of the time or something. Fifty four. Right. It was it was a small amount, right? Yeah, like trying to be right all the time. Trillion is just, bets a day. It's impossible. Yeah. Um. Okay. Right. So we have to talk Elon's about Elon back at it again. I mean, yeah, we have to. So I just want to quote. Let's let's kick it off with a Matt Levine quote. So Matt Levine wrote: "There is a popular view." That Musk has the option to abandon the deal if he pays a $1 billion breakup fee. That, I mean, that's what I thought. I saw people saying that. He said, as we have discussed around here, that just isn't true. The contract gives Twitter the right to force him to close and put up the $27.5 billion of equity that he has committed to the deal as long as the debt financing is available. Uh, on the other hand, what if he does it anyway? What if he just says, no, I'd rather not close? What is Twitter going to do? Sue him? It is easy for me sitting here and looking at the contract to say that Twitter would win that lawsuit and a court would order Musk to pay the money and close the deal. Uh, but actually making that happen file requires filing a lawsuit and going to court and asking a judge, blah, blah, blah. So basically, Elon like could do whatever he wants. The whole thing is a game of chicken. So I know I know it's really cool for people right now to, to look back at a show like Friends and say, like, Friends was overrated and it wasn't good. That was like the biggest show ever back in the day. Like, there's a lot of people who are, Friends was a great show. Exactly. There's a lot of people who say it got bad in the later years, but the early years of Friends still hold up in my mind. And there's a lot of people who were like, they're, they're too cool for Friends, you know, like Friends was whatever. But there was an episode with Chandler where he was breaking up with his annoying girlfriend Janice for like the eighth time. And he told her he <laughs> couldn't break up with her. So he said, instead of telling her he's breaking up with her, he said, I'm moving to Yemen. And she kept calling his bluff and be like, okay, fine, I'm going to come to the airport with you to go to Yemen. And he bought a plane ticket and he said, all right, see you later. She said, no, I'm coming to the gate with you back when you could do that. And she called his bluff until he finally just, okay, I guess I'm going to Yemen. And I feel like that's the Elon Musk saga here. They're, they're, they're both calling each other's bluffs. And he's like, until I can get a handle on these bots and make sure that the bot problem is not more than 5%. And then what if Twitter says, okay, here's the, here's the evidence. Well, what about then I'm, then I'm not going to do it until I do this. Like, I feel like they're going to call his bluff until he just, he owns Twitter and he doesn't know what to do with it. So do you, do we think that he is, that he never intended to buy Twitter in the first place, that he uses all as a guise to dump his Tesla stock to finance this, right? Because he said over the years, multiple times that the stock of Tesla, that the price of Tesla was too high. He said that multiple times. Or do we think that he's like, well, wait a minute. Now my Tesla's worth less and or Twitter, if the market is down, you know, if tech stocks are down 50% in some cases, should I should get a discount on Twitter? I'm not. I'm not uh, agreeing to those terms. I think, like, what do we think? What I do think you think his motivation is? I think it's the second one. I think he's seeing the market and growth tax. Like, Twitter would be down way more than it is right now if if he didn't have the buyout offer on the table. Easily I think his down timing 50, on this, right? His timing on this was just really bad, unfortunately. And the offer he made was way too high for market conditions right now. And I'm guessing he's trying to renegotiate. That would be my. Imagine yeah, being like, a Twitter employee right now. That's got to be tough. Well, you saw yesterday the CEO of Twitter did a did a did a thread, and Elon Musk responded with a poop emoji. Strange times. Um, Robin asked me randomly. She goes, "What happens if inflation keeps going up and the economy stops growing?" And I looked at her and I was like, "You mean like stagflation?" And I was like, "What do you even? Where? Where do you? Why are you asking me this?" Because she doesn't. You know, I think she's like, "Oh, I saw something at Good Morning America." By the way, every other news story is about inflation still. That that's the political pressure here for for the Fed. Okay, to get Michael control, Strahan. Michael Strahan is my wife's view into the financial world. Right. I have uh, Savannah Guthrie for my wife about inflation. So <laughs> every day, prices are going higher. Not used car prices. Okay. What do we got? All right. Used car prices are down three months in a row. They're only okay. up fourteen percent year over year. Okay. So knowing that 
inflation is terrible politically. Like that, that is, if it wasn't obvious before, it's obvious now. This is from Heather Long. Commerce Secretary uh, Gina Raimondo on why she doesn't want to lift tariffs on Canadian lumber. Lumber prices are already down about 40%, and the Canadians don't play fairly. We are trying to protect American industry, not on the table to waive these. I, I guess the trade war stuff has been kind of pushed to the back of uh, the newspaper. Why do we still have any tariffs on when inflation is so high? Why aren't we – inflation is high around the globe. Why aren't we doing like a 6- or 12-month embargo on these tariffs? Why are they still here? This makes zero sense have- to me. This, isn't, this is the easiest political win in history. Guess what? The guy who was president before me put on these stupid tariffs. We don't want them anymore. We're getting rid of them. I have no idea what they're doing. Like, it's like they want to lose the White House. Is, I don't that, know. is this not the, you, it, even if it's just optics? Me. Why wouldn't you do Okay. Uh, this is from Pew Research. Percentage of people who say the following is blank in the country today a big problem, moderate problem, small problem, not a problem at all. Inflation is top of the, top of the heap. 70% say it's a big problem. Healthcare is high. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? By the way, look at coronavirus all the way at the end. All the way down Nobody the list. Cares. It's also kind of funny that 23% of people say unemployment is a big problem. 38% say it's a moderate big problem when an unemployment is basically the lowest it's been in like 60 years. So, Yeah, one out of five say unemployment is a very big problem. Wow. Huh. This, is, this is why we're anti-survey, but you know. All right. So if you look back, here's another one. U.S. Uh, index of consumer sentiment. You and Wait, Josh and you I have, you have a you have a, car, you have a you have a you have a car dealership story. Do I? Oh, okay. So I went to the car dealer. My wife got a Hyundai Palisade, and they said that your first oil change is free. Bring it to the dealership. So I brought it there, and unfortunately, it made me get out of my car and wait in the waiting room instead of just doing it while I'm sitting in the car. You know, at a Valvoline kind of place. So I'm sitting there. There's an old lady, probably in her seventies, and she's flipping the remote to try to find a news station and she finds a cable news network and I won't, don't have to tell you what it is but she her outlook on the world is negative I don't have to tell you what the news station was <laughs> and I'm sitting there eating my chipotle waiting for my car to be done and she she's one of those people who just starts talking you know loudly so people can hear and I'm the only one in the room she goes she goes look at this supply shortage stuff can you believe it and she kind of looks at me to like agree with her and I'm like yeah it's crazy yeah. and she goes listen I was born in the 50s I grew up in the 60s that was prosperity. Then the 70s happened in the 80s. It's all been downhill from there. Everything is just terrible in this country. And she wants me to like agree with her. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. And uh, I, I do feel like, I mean, obviously part of that is nostalgia. And, but I, I feel like there's a certain subset of the population that is just going to be negative at all things at all times. And the news has kind of broken their brain. And there's, there's no going back. For, I don't know what how many people that is, but I, I think the, the infiltration has just, it's like a chip was implanted in their brain that everything is bad no matter what. And there's no fixing anything. Anyway, she was not happy about the supply shortages. All right, let's, let's I, I want to talk about cars for a second, actually. So J.P. Morgan, Michael Semblis team, put out a huge report on energy. So this is interesting. There are power drivers, Ben. The top 10% of drivers burn 32% of all gasoline. The bottom 60% of drivers burn less, th- less gasoline than the top 10%. How about that? What is that? How do they, so what does that mean? Like I would put that myself drive all the time? like, yeah, I don't, I'm not a big driver. I drive to the train station. So they ask, who are these gasoline super users? All right, here are some stats. They drive three times more miles than the average driver. They are more likely to drive pickups and SUVs. They are more likely to live in rural areas, that's obvious. They have similar income ed- education levels as the general population, and they spend 8 to 13% of their income on gasoline, which is over 2x as much as the average driver. But here's what, okay. here's, here's what I really want to say. Here's what I really want to say. Look at this chart showing that cars last a lot longer than they used to. You see this, Ben? So the average age of a car in 1972 was like six and a half years. Today, it's 12 years. So if the, if the, and it also shows the top 20 vehicles sold in 2021. All right, so the Ford F-Series and the Ram pickup and the Chevrolet Silverado are number one, two, and three. Ben, if you actually adjust for time, maybe they're not such a bad deal. What do you think about that? But. By the way, truck drivers not happy with me last week. I got a lot of people saying, <laughs> I'm, "I'm siding with, I'm coming to their defense." <laughs> we we don't back in 
to spots because it looks cool. We back in because of the axle placement or something. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's because your trucks are too big. You made my point for me. They're too big for parking lots. But here's the thing. You know, back I, I actually, about- I backed my truck in. I don't have a truck. I, I, have a, I have a Jeep. I actually backed my Jeep at the Trader Joe's yesterday, and I felt, I felt self-conscious. What if a podcast listener was, was looking at me? <laughs> Back to your point about how cars last longer. Remember in all the old horror movies of the 80s and 90s where someone would be trying to start their car when the person at serial killer is chasing yeah, them, I, and it, it, it wouldn't turn over? Like yeah, but, but yeah. the car wouldn't turn over. That doesn't happen anymore. You hit a button, and the car starts regardless. Right. By the way, sorry, truck drivers. I didn't mean to hurt any. There were some people who were not happy. Uh, Can I tell you something? I, I went out to dinner on Friday night, as you know, or maybe Saturday night. Actually, a little peek behind the curtains. I, I went, I, so my wife said, it, it was like, it wasn't like a fancy place, but it was like a nice place. You know, I couldn't wear like this t-shirt, for example. So my wife said, you, you need to wore, get- You couldn't wear your full. Natty Light shirt there? She said, what are you wearing for tonight? I went into my closet and uh, I wasn't really finding much, let's just say. So I went, <laughs> I hopped over to Bloomingdale's and I FaceTimed Ben and I said, what do I get? And, and he I told said, me to get a, what did you tell me? A, a linen I shirt? Buy a nice linen shirt for the summer. And you picked one that was like $250. You didn't no, no, buy no, no, that, no. did you? No, of course not. Okay. It was the first one that I picked up. It was, okay. I, I went to, there was a the first shirt that I saw. It was like $250. No, in this economy, forget about it. No offense. I, but anyway, so we. I cannot see you shopping. Yeah. Like I, I can't picture it. I hate it. I literally, it gives me anxiety. I don't know why, but just like. Holding like a shirt, I just it's like my worst nightmare. I really don't like it. That's why I shop on Instagram. But I went out, the the couple picked us up and he drove a sedan. I haven't been in a sedan in like 15 years. I didn't felt good. I miss sedan. If I could, if I didn't have three kids, I would be driving a Honda Accord right now. I love Honda Accords. That's my car. Give me a Honda Accord and I'm happy. So I, I think I might I think I might my next car might be a sedan. If you only have two kids, you're good there. All right, this is from you. It's been 15 years since you could beat inflation with a savings account. I think this must be from J.P. Morgan's uh, Guide to the Markets. Yes. So they show the savings account yield and then inflation. Here's the thing. I think the outlier is actually the previous years where you could do it. I don't think if the Fed does its job going forward, why should you be paid to hold cash above the rate of inflation? Like, that's probably never going to happen again. I think that that happening in the past is is probably – I think savers in the past were probably spoiled. All right, Bill McBride on the path forward for housing, he did a piece basically trying to say, what are the higher mortgage rates going to do with for housing prices? Uh, He's saying the last time this this really happened, like a huge, huge spike in mortgage rates in a very fast period of time was 1979 to 1982. In 1982, prices declined about 1% from the peak. 1991, there was a little real estate bust, declined about 3% from the peak. So people, we did it again on our mailbag yesterday. People keep asking, should I wait for a pullback? A nationwide pullback is very, very rare. He said the data seems to argue for slow house price growth scenario, but my view is most likely that house prices will stall in nominal terms and decline in real terms. So he's, he's, he's kind of saying, I think it's probably going to just flatline for a while. And then if inflation remains high, you're going to lose money on a real basis. But guess what? No one looks at their house price on a real basis, right? Everything is nominal in housing prices. Mm-hmm. Right. They, so He says a bust with housing prices falling 5 to 10% nominally is the least likely scenario. And I, I tend to agree. It, that would be great for people buying their first-time home. I just don't think it's, it's Well, because people aren't going to panic sell their houses. They're not going to panic no. sell their houses. It's not like a stock. It wasn't, exactly. And it wasn't people that got over-levered that are going to get foreclosed on. Right. These people can afford to do it, right? Let's move on to great quarter, guys. So, Ben, this is, this is a face blower right here. Disney stock... Crossed hundred dollars for the first time, sometime in two thousand fifteen. It's basically where we are today. Isn't that wild? Considering the the mark we've been in. Well, they. I mean, I guess they got punished for having a parks division in twenty twenty, and now they're getting punished for having a streaming division because of Netflix. That this is this is all Netflix related, right? They're catching strays from Netflix. By the way, I was thinking about this. I was talking about this with my wife this well, week. Yeah. In the pre, this is this is old man yells at kids to get off his lawn kind of stuff. Remember in the pre-streaming days when you you would only watch network television and the whole summer there would just be no new shows? Like, the the season would end in May and then the summer would literally just be game shows and, re, and reruns. And there, it was like, we, we all just... Saved by the agree, bell. We, we all just agreed... And saved by the bell. We all just agreed, like, let's not have any new TV shows in the summer. Who needs that? Remember that? Like, we had a whole, like, three-month period every year where there's just no new shows. Like, eh, we're fine. We don't need them. 
I, I, we just skip shows. Are you saying shows. that's good? No, I'm saying people this, people complain about streaming and not having enough to watch, and like it's not good anymore. I, I think we're a little spoiled with the amount of stuff we have to watch these days. Maybe maybe it was better because people just oh, get, totally. out and I, get I, stuff. Dude, I still think Netflix is magic. Like streaming is magic because to it your really point, is. forget about like even when what, what what did you have to do to get Netflix when it first started streaming? Did you have to like send it from your laptop onto your TV through the Apple TV that way? Oh, because there was no apps and smart TVs. That's a good question. How did question. that work? I remember. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't really remember how that worked. The I used to have to buy a Netflix little internet dongle to plug is... into my. You had to plug into the back of your TV. I had this little like <laughs> Wi-Fi router thing. You had to plug it into the USB, and that was how you got it. But it, it didn't work very good at all. Now it works like yeah, with a touch of a button. How about this? Yeah, I was thinking about this. We grew up with the internet. When you had to like download movies, and it took like fourteen hours. Yeah, we lived a hard life, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Anyway, okay. So, so Disney. So the science of hitting is a fantastic uh, subscriber. It's a it's a it's a post that I subscribe to. Um, he breaks down a lot of the companies that we speak about. So D- Disney. It's a newsletter. Disney has 138 million global subs. They've reported this week, up 33 percent year over year. Domestic parks and experiences generated $1.4 billion in operating income in the second quarter, an increase of more than 30% compared to pre-pandemic levels. That's domestic. But Disney China has been shut for like two years, I think. So that's hurting. Look at this chart showing the global paid subscribers of Netflix versus Disney. Pretty impressive. Actually, very impressive how quickly Disney has caught up. They almost got them. You can see Netflix slowing for a while there too, can't you? Uh, and then this, this surprised me. I always thought that like the network TV, the ESPN, ABC was like a huge drag. Not necessarily. Look at this chart. No, for a long linear time, networks, that was their biggest the linear network maker. segment generated $2.35 billion in operating income in the quarter. It's up 3% year over year. I thought it was shrinking. You said, would you rather own Netflix or Disney here? That's actually tough because if you're thinking the better business really right tough, now, it's right? got it. Well, it's got the better business has to be Disney because I still think the experience economy and people getting back out and doing stuff and services is going to continue to explode. I think Disney for the next like 18 months is going to be packed year round, but Netflix is down 70%. I'd still think I'd probably lean Disney. I guess the risk, the risk with Netflix is how do they transition to an advertising based platform? Right. Because they're not growing anymore. Yeah. All right. Did you, did you, did you read Coinbase or anything? No. I mean, I did a post on this. The, the bottom line is that retail volume is down like 50-something percent. Like a massive, massive dry up. And the problem is they are still spending like uh, drunken sailors. They hired, I think, 3,000 people in the last 12 months, which is like three times the amount of people that they had working there last year. Well, it seems like... They had a, it, it they had a, big, be- they had a big loss... It sounds like Coinbase and Robinhood, places like that, were gearing up for 2020 and early 2021 to, to last forever at, for, for their staffing levels, and now they're having to cut back. I guess that's, that's kind the, of that, the I guess decline, the same thing happened the with rapid decline, The rapid decline last week in Coinbase was so sick. It was 100 bucks on Monday and 45 on Friday. Okay, so Sam Bankman freed came to Robinhood's rescue. Is it did it go back a little bit since he bought it? I think it was up like 25%. He bought like a 7% stake in it, 7.6% stake. We've been talking about someone coming in to buy Robinhood. We didn't really talk about FTX. And I don't know if that well, if we said that's coin, going I said to Coinbase. Happen. Yeah. But we were thinking more but traditional asset sense. managers. Actually, FT makes FTX makes a lot of sense. And I don't know. If I guess if you trust anyone to turn it around and help, maybe he can create a good wallet to get my crypto off the platform. But I, I I think this is for I, if I was Robin Hood, I'd be thrilled that this guy is bu- buying into our shares, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, good signal. But uh, Robin Hood like is getting He's like into crypto the Warren gap. Buffett. Okay, they're coming it's back. Get, it's getting into it's getting into the gap. So uh, Walmart reported this morning. It's down like eight percent now. I think they cited inflation, and uh, I don't well, know. That was one of the best performing said, stocks of the year too. The string of companies that are down 70% and fall 25% after earnings is so nuts. Unity was another one of those. Like, there's just so many. So, we've got retailers this week. That'll be interesting. But 
I think we had United Airlines this morning, and I believe they got it higher. So I forget who tweeted this, but the transition from goods, especially durable goods, obviously that boom was over, to services is here. That's another reason this could continue to be the weirdest recession ever. We could have people traveling all over the place, and the country's technically in a recession, right? Like we're gonna have. I I, I still think like this summer is gonna be a massive travel boom for people. Not Don't to brag, you think concerts I'm, I'm traveling are next be... week? Yeah, concerts too. Exactly. Concerts. So concert activities could be at an all time high. There's gonna be a lot of other things that are all time high. Okay, so Crunchbase had this thing on Andreessen Horowitz and a few of the other big tech private people, Tiger and such. And they did this thing where they looked at all of the companies that have gone public from A16Z's venture capital fund, Airbnb, Coinbase, Roblox, Robinhood, Open Door, Affirm, all these companies, BuzzFeed, have just gotten crushed as public companies, right? All of the ones that went public from them, pretty much all of them are down. Airbnb is the only one that that is slightly higher, but that's because they had a big pop in the first day. Why don't some of these companies that are now bigger take some of these companies private again? Why don't some of these big venture companies pool together and just take them private again if they, if they still believe in the technology? Shouldn't we be seeing some of this at, at these levels where these companies are just getting annihilated? Or do you think that's just too much of a stretch for, some of the, for, for a VC firm to I do? Just don't think it's what they, I just don't think it's what they do. But I'm, I'm saying if, if you're comparing what you can get for a valuation in like growth equity versus public markets right now. The public markets have to look more appealing because these companies are getting just decimated. So a company down 90% versus a company that's marked down 40% in the private markets that should be down 80, you'd think the public markets actually more, I don't know, w- would make more sense for them right now. All right. You want to do crypto stuff or not? Well, you want to do what? Oh, this is a good take. Somebody tweeted, Peloton convinced rich people to pay $2,000 for a bike and to pay $20, $30 a month to use it and still failed as a business. Yeah, I was jealous of that take. It, it really is. Like, you don't think about the fact that, oh, that's right. You don't just buy a bike. You're paying recurring revenue. And the company still fell 90 plus percent from the highs. Just real quick on the, on the crypto stuff. Joe and Tracy had a really good podcast talking about the dynamics of what exactly happened with the Terra algorithmic stablecoin that, that broke the buck. I got to say, Malafine had the right take. I listened to that whole podcast. I still don't understand what an algorithmic stable coin is. It still doesn't make sense to me. Sorry. Like, could, could you explain it to someone who's a crypto noob? <laughs> well, they say if you, can't, if you can't explain it, you don't understand it well enough. So I'm going to say I don't understand it well enough. But here's, here's, my, here's my attempt. Terror was a stable coin. And it had a, it had a, like a pair trade with Luna. Same thing with US dollar and, and the yen, for example. It was Terra on the one hand, it was Luna on the other hand. And whenever the imbalance got one way, people could either redeem Terra for Luna, or if it got too far the other way, they would redeem Luna for Terra. So it was supposed to like burn and redeem and, and all that sort of stuff to keep it in line. And anytime there was a gap, the arbitragers would come in and immediately close that gap. But it broke, and it broke quickly. Right. I, I do think... This kind of story, maybe people in the mainstream don't aren't going to pay attention to this very much, but I don't think this kind of story is going to help with mainstream adoption for people because it, it's got all the bad things about crypto. The, the crypto bro who was calling people poor on, on Twitter. He's horrible. The guy who found just, it. Just a yes. horrible so, person. So Do, Do Kwan, the, the guy behind this, was definitely in the half fun staying poor camp. Just really put out repugnant shit on Twitter. And I, I hope that this is a lesson for people like it's just stupid. Why, why ever do that? When things are going really well, just like don't tempt the market gods. So, here, so here's Matt Levine with the correct take on this. He said, safe assets are much riskier than risky ones. This is, I think, the deep lesson of the 2008 financial crisis and crypto loves relearning the lessons of traditional finance. Systemic risks live in safe assets. Equity like assets, tech stocks, Luna, Bitcoin are risky, and everyone knows they're risky, and everyone accepts the risk. If your stocks or Bitcoin go down by 20%, you are sad, but you are not that surprised. And so most people arrange their lives in such a way that if their stocks or Bitcoin go down by 20%, they're not ruined. And then he contrasts that with, with things that are supposed to be safe, safe where people tend to that's put more why, money in. And then That's why Bernie Madoff was such a genius with his Ponzi scheme. He wasn't promising 40% a month or something like the actual right. Charles Ponzi. He was promising 11 or 12% per year, but you just never went down. And every month was just a steady return. That's what sucked people, so many people into that one. Same thing. 
People are really pissed off about Tom Brady's contract, the $375 million over 10 years. I think, who was I listening to? Oh, uh, who's the guy on on um, uh, uh, on the ringer that does like uh, um, culture and, and business? The town? The town. Oh, yeah. Matthew Howard Bellamy, one. I think is his name. So he was talking about this, and it's, it's, it's the absolute correct take. Who gives a shit who's calling the game? I mean, for the most part. Like, at least as far as NFL ratings go, they have proven that it doesn't move the needle. So why would Fox shell out this type of money? It makes no sense. This is, this is one of those things that you do it because everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is spending money, so you have to spend money too. That's the way it works. They're all lemmings. Um, but uh, anyway, no, hey, I mean, I, I don't really Tom, care. Tom Brady is going to be a steal. Sorry, it's going to work out. I'm bullish. He's not going to be great. And he's, he'll be okay. okay. All right. Um, the char- all right, chart else? of the week. Chart of the week. Someone uh, tweeted this to me, and it's Breaking Bad viewers versus Better Call Saul viewers per episode, and it shows Breaking Bad. What chart this is? Slowly but surely builds, builds, builds. In the last season, like it spikes as people caught up. Better Call Saul had a massive first episode or whatever, and then has slowly but surely fallen away. So all you people who were hating on me for my Better Call, Better Call Saul, by the way, I've caught up and I've watched all the episodes this season. It doesn't get better. It's st- I'm still hate watching. Really? Sorry. Chris, Chris, is, Chris takes umbrage with your take. I, I heard that, and uh, my take stands. All right. I mean, he, but rec- he's, he's watched, he's watched, he watched Fear the Walking Dead for seven seasons, so... I think his opinion is erroneous. Oof. Walking Dead was the ultimate, that horse picture of that back half looks great and then the front half looks like it was drawn by a child. <laughs> that show was, it was so good for like three seasons and then it just fell off a cliff. All right, we're going to, uh, we're going to skip listener questions because we did a whole listener mailbag. That's coming yeah. out on Monday. And we're going to do a private oh, no. mailbag. Monday. Yeah, yeah, next Monday. And we're going to do a private mailbag for our NFT holders. Still going strong in the Discord. We're going to do a, we do a private once a month for them. If you want to get in on that, we have a mailbag that comes straight to us, and it's just for people who are in the Discord and in the hold our NFTs. Anyway, I rewatched A Quiet Place 2 on Prime this weekend. And rewatched? I think we t- Why? We, we wa- I like rewatching decent movies once in a while. Just, uh, sometimes I think you have to get a, like a second opinion because some movies age better, some age worse. The that first movie, 10 that minutes, movie was, was, was phenomenal. The first 10 minutes when the aliens come, that's my favorite thing when, like, in Sick. an alien movie. When, when you first see the aliens, the first 10 minutes of the movie were so good that that might be one of the better sequels of all time, I think. When you compare like the, the quality of the first one with the quality, I still think the first one was a smidge better. So I was trying to think, like, what are the best sequels ever? I came up with, and this was like top of the head, Godfather 2, Terminator 2, Back to the Future 2, Dark Knight, and Before Sunset. Did I miss anything? Wait, hang on. So, all right. Godfather, Terminator, Back to the Future, Dark Knight, Before Sunset. Awesome Powers um, 2 was good. Oh, here's what, here's what I tweeted. I tweeted in May 2021 in, after the theater. By the way, that was my first, that was, that was a big moment for me. That was my first time back in the theater. That's one that I, I kind of wish I would have seen the quiet place. I loved The Quiet Place. The second one was even better. Yeah, that was weird. I wish I would have seen it in the theater. All right, okay. Here's one. Uh, wait, one more. Here's one of the worst movies I've seen in a while. It's on Paramount Plus. It was out in the theaters. I think I actually did okay in the theaters. It's called The Lost City with Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum. And we're like, all right, it looks like kind of that? a rom I don't know. It looks like a rom com, but there's also heard okay. Brad Pitt is in it. It was awful. Probably one of the worst movies I've seen in a long time. Just really bad. Terrible. Don't see it. Well, I finished I finished uh, the Marksman, the Liam Neeson movie. That was that was that was yeah, that was one of the worst movies I've ever seen. What what's the deal with Liam Neeson? What do you think his kill count is across all of his movies in the past 10 years? Got to be in the thousands, right? <laughs> that guy's killed a lot of people. I was, I was very upset with the, with the Game 7 loss. That's what I spent my week doing. I didn't watch any movies this week. Just basketball? Which one are you most set, upset about, the yeah. Suns or the Bucks? Well, I bet on the Bucks to win the East and to win it all. This was like, I don't know, I did it a few months ago. I really, I really did not think the Celtics were going to beat them. Tatum? Game six was was sick, and being a New York sports fan and not a South, uh, uh, New England sports fan, I, uh, I'm mad. I get it. And betting on the Bucks, I'm I'm bitter. Yeah, I bet on the Bucks and. And now, like final, so I lost. Now, as a New York Knicks fan, what do you do? You could, do you you can't root for the Heat and you can't root for the Celtics. 
you have to just hope that uh, the Warriors or the Mavericks are able to ca- take care of them. Okay. I'd root for Luka now. That's my rooting interest. I'm rooting for Luka. Yeah. But 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 I don't think Luka could, could win the finals, so I'm, I'm rooting for Golden State. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Um, uh, I don't think I watched anything other than basketball this week. All right. Animal Spirits Pod at gmail.com. Shoot us an email. We'll see you next time.